Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 57 of A Yank on the Footy. I'm Craig Wessels from Sandusky, Ohio, and I'm glad that you're listening. Before I dive into this episode, I wanted to touch on one thing that I failed to mention in last week's grand final review, and I'm kind of kicking myself for not having done it, which, you know, would have been nice if we kicked a few more things during the grand final, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I guess I missed this watching the, uh, the departure of Gary Ablett as he's heading off the grounds at the GABA. And it was uh, it was something I didn't pick up on, and I actually read about it, and it was just an absolutely classy move on the part of the Tigers. where And it sounds as though Dusty Martin came up with the idea and it touched base with uh, Patrick Dangerfield about this, and I don't know if that's the case or not, but they tucked their premier, premiership medals away, whether they put them in their pockets or they handed them off to a loved one or whatever the case may be. They didn't have the medals around their neck as they'd already been awarded them as they didn't want to distract from the importance of Gaz's guard of honor as he left the ground for the last time. And, you know, while the sting of last week's loss has subsided a little bit for me, I wanted to give the Tigers a a big shout out for this class act. It was it was very cool. And quite frankly, this is one of those things that helps to reinforce the stuff that I talked about way back in the first and second episode of this podcast where I mentioned how I really thought that the players were in tune with the fans and they're obviously in tune with one another. Sure. There's, you know, that pugilistic battle of going on on the ground during the course of the game. But I think ultimately they have respect for one another after the course of the game. So I absolutely love the sportsmanship on the part of the, uh, the Tigers. And while my cats came up on the short end, you know, Richmond, your selfless actions there, should be commended because you had just won the premiership. You're the champions and you set that aside for several minutes to allow one of the greatest to walk off the grounds in the fashion that he did. And this cats fan can't say thank you enough for that. It's very cool. And I think a lot of teams in a lot of sports around the world could learn a lot from the way the AFL goes about doing things. So, I just want to make sure I mention that before I got going here. And now that the season's been completed, reports have started to come out that are looking at what the the actual costs were that were incurred by the AFL to go ahead and operate the Queensland hub in order to get the the 2020 fixture played. And it's it's the numbers are staggering. I mean they're downright staggering. And I linked to this article here, but according to Yahoo Sports, Queensland generated over $136 million in revenue due to the AFL relocating much of the competition to the state. Now, again, many of the games were played with people not in the stands or with small crowds. So this number could have even been larger had they been able to sell more tickets. So it was just, it was amazing. They they, they mentioned here that, uh, that there were 100, 101,000 hotel nights for all of the people that were there. 101,000 hotel room nights. 400,000 meals, 10,000 rental cars that were rented, and I'm sure driven around quite a bit during the time they were there. So if you happen to be in Australia and you're in the market for a used car, I think some of the used car agencies in Queensland are going to be looking to replace some of the automobiles that were driven over the last several months there because I think they got a lot of miles on them. So you might be able to get yourself a pretty decent deal on a used car up in Queensland. They also sponsored 950 bus trips, 120 charter flights, bringing people into the hub, going back and forth between Adelaide and Perth and up to Cannes. Uh, So they they were flying all over the place. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing that they were able to pull this off. And Queensland ended up hosting 80 games in this year's fixture. Okay. And that's, you know, there to be applauded, the government in the, the state of Queensland is to be, is to be applauded. The, the groundskeepers in Gold Coast and the groundskeepers at, uh, at the Gabon at Metricon are to be commended for keeping the, the grounds in as good a condition as they possibly could with the amount of games being played on that grass. I mean, it, they're to be applauded for that. It was, it was terrific to see that. It was great that they were able to get the games in. And I, and I know... You know, again, I've only been following the game for a little over four years, so I don't have the background, but many, many folks 
you know, didn't think that the 2020 season was ideal and that there are some purists of the game that want to put a little asterisk next to the Tigers name in the premiership record book. Um, you know, I think that the, uh, the AFL Queensland and to a, a lesser extent, South Australia and West Australia, even along with New South Wales, when games were still being played in Sydney, they have to be commended for ensuring that this fixture got completed this year. Now, granted, yes, they, they, they lopped five games off of the season. Okay, so they played 17 rather than 22 games. But that was something that I think that had we thought about this back when the first round ended and they shut the season down, how many of us thought the season was going to actually start back up and that they were going to play any games? I was thinking that my first year as an actual member of the Cats was going to be for one game, that it was going to be all for naught. And, you know, I, I, I'm impressed that they were able to get this done, okay? And uh, it helped to distract us from either a terrible winter or summer, depending upon where you live, you know, once the games did get going again. So I, I while it wasn't perfect, things sure as hell could have been a lot worse had there not been any games played at all. I think it was a great distraction for those of us who were unable to get to where we wanted to go. We were locked down, whatever the case may be. And, you know, while this was an economic boom for, for Queensland, you know, let's, let's be honest, you know, the AFL is going to be taking quite a few years in order to uh, help stabilize their finances. They took out that significant loan in order to keep the league afloat this year, and they're going to be having to work at paying that back for years to come. Now, it does sound as though there's been some good news in Victoria regarding travel and, and many of you being able to utilize some of the businesses that had been previously off limits. Um, I've seen several people on Twitter that have you know, posted that they're looking forward and they're excited about heading out to a bar to actually interact with some other people and see them and, and drink a beer or whatever the case they may be wanting to have there or going to a restaurant. And I'm thrilled that, uh, that there's some normalcy coming back to those of you in Victoria and that you're going to be able to hopefully enjoy a beautiful summer so hopefully the weather is fantastic for you that you enjoy some some great some great times and that uh the hot weather goes ahead and burns up this uh virus and that we're really really close to getting ourselves a uh vaccine in order to end this thing and have it be over with now i wanted to touch on some of the news of the week as we're in the midst of the free agency period uh, the trade period opens up on November the 4th, and it runs through the uh, the 12th of November. And again, for those of you who are American fans, it's a very short period of time. Okay, the, There is no mid-season trade deadline like they have in Major League Baseball or in the NHL or the NBA or even the NFL. And the NFL's trade deadline, I believe, is November the 3rd. So some teams may be still making some deals between now and... Uh, I believe that would be Tuesday of next week. Um, this is a very short period of time in which uh, teams have opportunities to build their list and fill the positions that they can fill prior to the draft coming up in December. Now, if I'm not mistaken, typically in a, in a regular season, the draft would, would be held in November rather than in December. But with everything being pushed back, they end up pushing the draft back a little bit as well. Now, there have been some big moves that have been made already. And there are going to still be, I'm sure, some other significant moves that are being made. I find it strange, though, quite frankly, that the that the trade period and free agency period, free agency period are even taking place right now. And that's because, if I'm not mistaken, the clubs haven't even been notified yet about list sizes for next year. They don't know how many, I don't believe they know how many players are going to be able to be on their roster or on their list for next year. So... It's really a difficult process to put together a list not knowing how many players you're going to be allowed to have. So if you're putting together a list that's going to ha that right now has got you know 38 players on it and you have you know four draft picks, that's going to get you up to 42 and if I'm not mistaken you can carry 45 players on your list. I believe that's the correct number. There may be some little variations here and there. But what if you got your you're 38 players, 
and you've added your four in the draft, you know, you're planning on adding your four in the draft, and they say, oh, no, no, we're going to cut the list size back to 35. Well, now you've still got four picks to, to add in there, and you've, you're already over on the list, so you, what, do you have to cut three of the players that you have or possibly even seven of the players that you have in order to bring these new draft picks in? I think that's the one thing that I've noticed in this season that that the AFL has not really done a good job with. And I, I again, I may have missed where they've notified the teams about list sizes, but I haven't seen anything about that at all yet. And I think that that's a, a, uh, a significant error on the part of the AFL in terms of getting the, uh, the teams going into the 2021 season, hoping that they'll be able to play on their own home grounds and hopefully in front of a few fans at least. Sounds like uh, some of the teams are mentioning that it's going to be members only at the uh, contests. So if you're not a member, you're definitely not going to be able to get tickets. Now, I wanted to j- jump into some of the moves that have gone on this week, and some of them are ones that we suspected were going to happen, and others were ones that we were shocked by, quite frankly. And one of the biggest non-secrets took place early in the in the uh, the free agent period where you know J- Joe Danaher has agreed to head to Brisbane to join the Lions. And the Bombers are going to be getting pick number seven as compensation for him. And again, they tried to get, if I'm not mistaken, two first-round picks from the Swans last year to send him to Sydney. That trade didn't work out. Sydney did not want to give up two first-round picks. Turns out probably was not a bad move on Sydney's part to not make that trade. But you have to wonder, though, you know, the Bombers, I think, are making out okay here. Sure, they're losing... A, a name that is synonymous with Essendon football. Maybe he'll come back to finish out his career there. I don't know. But this is a this is a player who, you know, when healthy, has been a dominant leaper. He's been one of those guys that, you know, as somebody that's new to the game, took notice of Joe Danaher and his ability to, to take marks in unbelievable situations. But he's played less than 25% of the Bombers' contests over the last three years. And they're going to get pick number seven for him. So I think that that pick has to look pretty attractive to the Bombers, knowing that they don't really have an idea of what they're going to get with him. Sure, he came back and he looked pretty good in the four games he played this year towards the end of the season, but is that going to carry over? I mean, I, I hope it. I certainly hope it does. I certainly hope that he's healthy and he's able to have a fantastic year for Brisbane, which I think is a great place for him to go. You know, it's a, it's a club that uh, could certainly use his leadership up forward. You know, that's a, uh, an organization that has, you know, seemingly sprayed the ball all over the grounds when it came to kicking goals. So having somebody that's kind of steady like him in the, in the forward 50 can only be beneficial to the Lions going forward. But I think that the, uh, that the Bombers, while they're losing this, this legacy name, off of their list have to be thrilled that they're going to be getting pick number seven out of this. Now, one of the, one of the other big moves that is happening now, it hasn't happened officially, of course, yet is Jeremy can Jerry, Jeremy Cameron possibly moving to the cats and the cats have signed him to a significant offer, which I think maybe they were hoping that GWS would uh, just say, Hey, well, that's nice. Go ahead, Jeremy, enjoy your time in the hoops and take your comp pick. Well, they didn't. They decided to match that offer. And uh, GWS seems to be losing players left and right, as we'll see here in just a moment. But, you know, as a Cat supporter, I certainly understand doing everything that you possibly can to climb through that premiership window yet again before that window closes with the, the group of veteran players that they have right now. I get it. So adding somebody that's, you know, the caliber of player that Jeremy Cameron is, it's a no-brainer. It, it, I, it makes perfect sense to try to do it if you can. You know, it opens up the forward 50 for them. You know, defense, <clears throat> excuse me, defenses are going to have to pick their poison. Which Coleman medalist are you going to double team? Go ahead, tell me, which one? You're going you're gonna to double team Cameron? You're going to double team Hawkins? You know, it's, it's quite a conundrum for defenses to have to figure out what it is they're going to do. And I think that this would open up opportunities for people like Brian Myers, Gary Rowan to move freely around the uh, the forward 50 and and you know score goals that uh 
and again, I'm not making this comparison at all, but we saw what Dusty Martin did in the second half of the grand final. I'm not, I'm not saying, and you know, Gary Rowan, you know, was he at the game? I'm not sure. Cause there wasn't a whole lot in the stat book for him, but you know, both of those guys have a, a, a small amount of what Dusty Martin's able to do. I'm not, again, I'm not comparing, comparing them, but if they can do anything similar to what he does, that would make the Geelong offense even that more deadly having them able to do that. And then you're still, you know, you're still bringing your midfielders up forward to, to score as well. Um, you know, there is a downside to this though, you know, a significant portion of Geelong's best 22, if he's there, and even if he's not there is on the wrong side of 30. And I'm, I have to laugh to myself when I, when I talk about this sort of thing, when I say, yeah, these players are old because they're over 30 and here I am on the wrong side of 50 saying that sort of thing. You know, well, I think Cameron might be able to help the Cats, you know, raise the cup next year at the MTG. Maybe the following year, if that was to happen. Again, I'm not making that sort of a prediction right now, but they would give them a pretty good club for the next couple of years. I think that within a few years, the Cats could look very, very much like the 2020 Hawks, who, let's be honest, took a rather precipitous tumble on the ladder this year. And they're now entering a significant rebuild. So the the list manager, Stephen Wells, is going to have to really think long and hard about, you know, parting with, with any of the young talent that the club has. I know, you know, that supposedly the, the Giants want uh, Brandon Parfit, and Brandon Parfit's uh, manager said he's not going anywhere. And again, that's one of those things, if you're in the U.S. and you're listening to this, the players have a lot more say so in terms of whether or not they want to go to other clubs. Now I don't think it's necessarily a, a definite absolute, but it's kind of become tradition that, you know, players, if they don't want to move to other clubs, they're not going to be going to other clubs. Okay. So yeah, they, you know, they have to be thinking long and hard about, you know, parting with this young talent in order to set up, you know, a short term reward, which again, getting a grand final is one heck of a, a short-term reward. But they also have this unique opportunity with the list that they have right now. And if they bring in, well, I'm going to talk about somebody here in just a moment. Supposedly there's another player possibly coming along to join them as well. Um, they've got three first-round picks this year. So they have an opportunity to to gird the bottom part of their list with some young talent and hopefully you know, we get a, a normal VFL season that allows these kids to actually play some meaningful, actual games and to develop their talents, that it, it will benefit this club when Tom Hawkins, Joel Selwood, Patty Dangerfield decide to hang things up. When they decide to step away from the game, that there'll be somebody there ready to step in and take their place. But if they, if they gut the squad for the purpose of bringing in Jeremy Cameron, they could find themselves in a significant rebuild situation like Hawthorne is in right now. So I, I get, I get it. I understand why they're going after Jeremy Cameron. I understand it. And maybe they decide not to work out a deal. Maybe they decide, you know what? These picks are important enough to us to hang on to. These players are hang, are important enough for us to hang on to, and we're going to go ahead and saddle GWS with this significant number on their salary cap. Maybe that's the strategy all along. I don't know. I, I and I don't know if that's the way things are done, but you know, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next few days. And there have been a number of players that have moved on and moved to other clubs. Rory Atkins has moved on from Adelaide. To Gold Coast is an unrestricted free agent. Uh, the Crows are going to be uh, adding pick number 36. That's what it is at the moment as compensation. And, uh, you know, and it's interesting because if you look at the Crows um, picks that they have coming up here, they've got, I think, number one, number eight. They have five picks in the top 36 in the draft and nine picks overall. Now, I, don't, I doubt they'll make all nine picks. They'll probably trade some to move up, but five of the top 36 picks are available to them, including the number one pick. 
So I, I think that this is this is a draft that is going to allow the, the rebirth of the Crows to get here before we know it. Okay? They played hard this year. If, if you watched any of their games, they were a tough opponent. Sure, they struggled to score, but they fought they fought hard. They didn't just give up. That that team fought hard all year long. And you know, Gold Coast is adding a quality midfielder who's, you know, career stats are between average and above average. So he's going to definitely help Gold Coast going forward here as they make a push further up the ladder, possibly finding their way into the eight this year. Maybe they got some talent to do that sort of thing. You know, the Suns also are uh, hoping to officially add uh, Oleg Markov and his Hall of Fame worthy mustache. Uh, as he's requested a uh, a trade to Gold Coast as well. And, you know, he was one of the Tigers' emergency players in last week's grand final. So I think that that in and of itself tells me that he's somebody that the Tigers would have liked to have hung on to and had on their list. But, you know, once this deal is complete, Markov plans on signing, I believe, I think I read a two-year deal with the Suns. So somebody who's definitely going to help them out, uh, going forward and you know he's got a uh he's got a world-class mustache so that's going to be a great uh selling point on some of their advertising and some of the posters and that sort of thing that they have for the club as well now zach williams has left the giants um and he's signed on with the blues and that deal's already signed and he signed a huge six-year deal with carlton and the giants are going to get pick number 10 as compensation for this. So he's get, they're going to get picked 10 out of the first round. So the Giants have an opportunity, if they choose to go this route, to possibly get a couple of first-round picks from the Cats for Jeremy Cameron. So they can have three first-round picks themselves to help reload the, the younger base of, of their list as well. And, you know, I wish Williams, you know, all the best going forward. And he, he was quoted on Twitter as saying that, uh, on, and, and the Carlton Twitter page posted this. He said, uh, where he said, quote, I used to go for Carlton as a young bloke. I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, and, uh, well, I have to give credit where credit is due. That The folks that are running the, the Mongrel Punt uh, Twitter page, they've got a great podcast. They, they run a great website as well. If you're not reading their stuff and you're not listening to their podcast, you should because they do a fantastic job. But, uh, they said that uh, that th- with their uh, Twitter, after Zach Williams had said that I used to go with Carlton as a young bloke, they responded saying, Zach Williams, no stranger to disappointment. Now, I have to admit, I thought that was pretty funny. You know, yeah, it's a bit of a shot at Carlton there. I'm not the one taking the shot there, but and I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. I thought it was a funny tweet. I do think Carlton's going to be pushing their way up towards the eight this year. Okay, I think this is this is an up and coming club, and adding someone of his caliber, I think, is only going to help them get better as they move forward. Now, Aiden Core also left the Giants. So the Giant, you know, the last person leaving GWS, turn the lights off, please. He signed uh, with North Melbourne, a five year deal for two and three quarter million dollars. And you know, let's be honest, he is definitely going to be playing an integral role with the Ruse this year, because. They got a ton of positions open because they they delisted eleven players at the end of the season, so he is definitely going to be in their twenty two, okay. And raise your hand if you were not shocked by this huge signing that I don't think anybody saw coming, okay. Isaac Smith leaving Hawthorne and signing with Geelong, yeah. Go ahead, raise your hand. You saw that. You knew that was happening, right? You knew right away. As soon as the season ended, yeah, Smith, he's gonna go he's gonna go to the Cats. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. He spent he spent a decade in the brown and gold. And I'm sure that most Hawk supporters probably saw him playing his entire career there. Now he brings a ton of experience to Geelong. He's gonna certainly help their midfield quite a bit. He's you know, again, he's another one of those guys that's thirty plus. He's got a you know, he averages twenty one plus disposals. A game, you know, I think he's going to be, you know, another great option in the midfield. And 
let's be honest. If if Jack Steven has a normal off season and is healthy, the Cats have some dynamic options in their midfield for next year. You know, that's assuming you know this Brandon Par- Brandon Parfit can still be there. Cam Guthrie is going to still be there. You know, we'll have to see who's still part of the club after the, the Jeremy Cameron deal comes down. You know, so it's uh, it's just not a deal that I saw happening. And I think it's a real positive one for for the uh, for the Cats. I think he's going to really be helpful to them, but uh, it's not one that I expected. Yeah, I've heard Sean Higgins is possibly still going to be coming on board. And, you know, again, the Cameron deal. And who knows who else, who knows who else is going to possibly be coming in. Or who's going out. And I'm going to go on record right now. Yeah, it sounds like he's leaving. It sounds like he's heading off to to Brisbane. But uh, it's going to be sad to see Nakaya Cockatoo go if he goes. Because if you've been listening since the uh, beginning of this podcast, way back in December of last year, young Mr. Cockatoo is the reason I ultimately chose to become a cat supporter. Watching his frenetic pace out on the ground, that sort of thing. And it sounded like he was back to being healthy up until he when he broke his wrist here towards the end of the uh, the pickup games up in uh, Queensland this year. So I hope that he's able to you know find a spot with the Cats still this year. But it sounds as though he's going to be heading off to uh, to join the Lions. And I've not seen anything confirming that yet. But it's it's been talked about. It's been bandied about. I think it's probably going to end up happening. It's, it's going to suck to see him go. And I'm still going to be a uh, a cockatoo fan, even if he's with Brisbane. I'm still going to be a cat supporter, but I'm going to want to see him be successful, by all means. Um, now, most of us were aware that Collingwood was going to be up up against a salary cap, that they had uh, made some deals that, that had really pinned them up against the wall, if you will. And uh, I'm really stunned by the way that they've been treating Adam Trelore this past week. Now, Trelore's contract, which I believe runs through the end of the 2024 season, it might be 2025, because it said it ran until 2025, so I'd have to go back and look at that. So it sounds like it maybe it lasts for four more seasons, but it's back-ended, so they're paying him more towards the end of the contract than they did at the beginning. And it sounds like the Pies just want to simply get his contract off of their books, or at least a portion of it anyway. Now, his partner, he and his partner just had a uh, a son not that long ago, and she has signed on to go play netball with a club up in Queensland, I believe in Brisbane next year. And the Pies are seemingly wanting to, quote, do him a favor by telling him another, to go find another club to play for. We don't want you anymore. Now, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of a tough thing. I mean, you've you've made a commitment there. You signed a five year deal with them. You said that you and your partner have figured out a way to make it work where she's going to be gone for the netball season, but you're you're planning on staying with your club. You have no desire to leave your club, and they're telling you to go find somewhere else to be. Now, he I think he could very easily say, No, I'm not going. And if they decide not to play him, I and I believe it was the uh, the gentleman from uh, the Lace Out podcast that said, well, he'd be the uh, the best paid regular in the VFL next year if they decide not to play him with the uh, with the senior group. I don't know what's going to happen there. I really don't. It's really sad for him, but I have a feeling that by November twelfth, Adam Trelaw is going to be on another club's list. And from what it sounds like, Collingwood's going to still have to pay part of his salary to make him go away. Which, you know, another team's going to get a pretty darn good player. And from what I have seen and from what I have heard, and I uh, I know I've talked about this before, but if you haven't listened to the uh, Narrowly Speaking, I'm sorry, the Ordinarily Speaking podcast episode with Adam Trelaw, check it out. It's powerful stuff. I mean, he, he's a guy who I'm now a fan of. Wherever he goes, I'm going to be a fan of his because of, of just the person that he seems to be. And, uh, you know, I, I wish him the best. I wish his family the best. Um, wherever the trade winds take him. Maybe he's going to Gold Coast. I don't know. Maybe he's going to Gold Coast. And maybe Gold Coast can hold out and say, hey, you know what? Uh, you're going to pay even a little bit more of the salary, okay? We're, gonna, we're not going to make this easy on you. 
You know, you want to do a salary dump, um, you're going to have to do that. Now, for those of you who are um, fans in Australia who are listening, and this is something that happened with uh, the football team that I, I, I cheer for here in the States, the Cleveland Browns. Uh, about four years ago, the team in Houston was wanting to, wanting to get rid of uh, one of their players, a quarterback by the name of Brock Osweiler. And they'd signed Osweiler to a very expensive contract. And at that time, the Browns were not very good. And they had a huge amount of money left on their salary cap that they could spend on something else. So what they did was that they they said, well, you can trade us Brock Osweiler. But we also want a second round draft pick. And then we'll send you back a fourth round draft pick. So you basically, you give us the guy and a high draft pick, and we're going to give you back a low draft pick. So they, they basically took on this guy and his salary in a salary dump, if you will. The, the, the other team wanted to get his, his salary off of their books. And they held on to him for, I believe, one season, and then they got rid of him themselves. But they got a second-round pick for it. So you know, I don't know if, uh, if the AFL allows that sort of thing to happen, that, hey, you want to get this guy off of your books? You know, we'll give you a fifth round draft pick and you give us a third round draft pick for taking him. You know, because I, I don't necessarily see that the other 17 teams in the in the uh, competition are going to want to do Collingwood any favors. Sure, I think most teams would like to have Adam Trelaw in their club, but I don't think they're going to want to say, well, yeah, let's go ahead and help out uh, the Magpies. I don't think it's going to happen. And supposedly Brisbane has already said, no, we're not interested. So even if, even if the... the uh, the significant other is heading up towards Brisbane. Brisbane doesn't seem to want to add him to their list. So it might be Gold Coast or Bust if he's going to Queensland. Or who knows where he's going to be next year. Looks like there is quite a number of openings uh, with North or with GWS because you know they've either delisted people or they've had people leaving to sign contracts elsewhere. And, uh, you know... A couple of other things I, I wanted to mention before I wrap up this episode. I wanted to give a big shout out of appreciation to uh, Harry Taylor as a cat supporter. I wanted to mention this. Uh, he announced his retirement a couple of days ago. He played all 13 seasons with the Cats. And this was one guy who was just durable as heck as a player. He averaged 21 and a half games a year throughout his career. Now, he uh, 2017, he only played, four, I believe, four games. He was injured qu- for much of the season. Might have been eight games, but uh, he didn't play a whole lot that year. But other than that, he, including that year, he averaged 21 and a half games. And his departure is going to leave a huge hole in the Cats' defensive structure that they're going to have to figure out how to fill because he was very good at what he did. Now, I feel bad that he did not get the send-off that he richly deserved. This is a man who played 280 games for the Cats. But I he's earned my respect and I think the respect of all Cat supporters, and he, I think just footy fans in general, because he allowed Gary Ablett Jr. to have his moment to take center stage for his send-off at the grand final. So I hope that next year, if the Cats are able to play at GMHBA Stadium, that they're able to bring him back in and have a Kerry Taylor day and give him the send-off that he deserved to have, but he didn't get because he's a classy player. So, yeah, again, Harry, thanks for all your hard work with the Cats. Enjoy your retirement. Okay, and uh, you have my respect, sir. And before I wrap up this episode, there are a couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, First of all, I want to express my condolences to the people at the hangar. Uh, The Bombers lost their longtime team physician, uh, Dr. Bruce Reed, a few days ago. He'd spent many years with Richmond before moving over to Essendon and spent 39 years with that club. He's going to be, you know, terribly missed. And from everything that I've read, he's an absolute icon in, in Bombers lore, and it's going to be really difficult to fill his shoes. So condolences to the uh, to the Essendon supporters and the people that work with the Bombers organization for the loss of uh, Dr. Reed. And lastly, the entertainment world lost an absolute icon earlier today. Sean Connery, the original and the best ever 007, having played that role seven times, having played James Bond seven times, died in the Bahamas at the age of 90 earlier today. And it has nothing to do with footy directly, but you know I couldn't find any direct correlation 
between Mr. Connery and the AFL, but I did find that in the 20, 2012 Euro Cup Australian Rules 9-on-9 championship, there was a Sean Connery division of teams that was made up of Ireland, Spain, Finland, and the Czech Republic. And sir, from the Untouchables to The Rock to The Hunt for Red October to the Indiana Jones films to countless other films, you entertained the world for seven decades. And rest easy, sir, and thank you so very much for your great memories. I have all, well, I have every James Bond film ever, ever made. I bought them all one at a time at a, at a discount store, and it took me about five years to do it because I had a little list that had all the names of the films on a little piece of paper that I kept in my wallet, and they had their section of DVDs, and every time I would go in, I'd go look and see if they had one of the new ones or one of the other ones in place, and I bought each one of them for $3 or less. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget that if you'd like to sign up for the mailing list so that you get each episode delivered to you first, there's a link to a short form in the show notes. It's like three questions, you know, your name, who you support, your email address, and I'll add you on there. Uh, if you'd like to sign up, I'd love to put you on the list. I added another name uh, just before I started recording this episode, so they're going to get this episode in their mailbox probably before you hear it. Also, if you got an idea for a show topic or someone that you think would be a great guest, please feel to reach out, uh, drop me a DM on Twitter, or shoot me an email. Send me a message uh, at Yank on the Footy on uh, Facebook. I'd love to hear from you. And don't forget that while you can find all episodes of this podcast at a yank on the footy.podbean.com, you can also find it on your favorite podcast provider. You can also find it on YouTube. Just search out my name on YouTube, Craig Wessels, at C R A I G W E S S E L S. That's my pod that's my my actual name, and uh, that's the name of my uh, YouTube channel. You can find every episode that's been created there. I just have a static video. It's not You won't see my face because, let's be honest, you'll want to turn it off if you do. Um, but now that you've listened, I'll uh, I ask that you consider giving me a review on Apple Podcasts. It le- lets me know what I need to work on. lets me know it's going well. And it lets uh, the podcast hosts know what you think of the show as well. And don't forget, you can reach me at yankonthefooty at gmail.com as well as on Twitter at yank underscore on. I'm also on Facebook and at Instagram. At a yank on the footy, I'd love to thank Mr. Joseph McDade for the use of a couple of pieces of his great music. I'm using Backplate and Elevation. Mr. McDade, you've created some fantastic music. You can find his work at josephmcdade.com slash music. He's also on Spotify. If you haven't done so yet, again, if you'd like to sign up for the email list, it's there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening. Because while we're fans of this game... We're fans of different clubs, but deep down, we all love this game. That's the game of footy. And for those of you that are in the States that are listening or in Canada that are listening, yes, there aren't any games on right now, but keep in mind, Australian Rules Football, it's why they invented the DVR. And if you're thinking about, you know, getting the Watch AFL app, check out afana.com, A-F-A-N-A.com. They've got a link to help you sign up for the Watch AFL app. Or you could become an international member of your favorite club. Ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you so very much. And I ask that you consider sharing the podcast with your friends and family. And may your dribble kick never hit the post. I'll catch you later. This has been episode number 57 of A Yank on the Footy. Don't forget that you can reach me at yank underscore on on Twitter or at yankonthefooty at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at A Yank on the Footy. You can also find the podcast on YouTube as well. Just search Craig Wessels. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening. And I hope you'll consider sharing the podcast with your friends and family. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>